Well, good morning. Over the last few weeks, we have been in the first chapter of Ephesians, and we're going to finish up our focus on that this morning in Ephesians chapter 1. And some of the things we've been discovering is how God blesses us. And to review a few of those things, uh, we learned that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heaven. None of them are left up in heaven. He's blessed us with them. And that means that we have a relationship with God through Christ Jesus. God has also blessed us by adopting us into his family. It's a blessing to be a part of a family. And through Christ, the redemption that he purchased for us on the cross, we are adopted into his family. He has blessed us with his grace that most beautiful of gifts, God's uh, undeserved favor towards us. We didn't deserve it, but God gave it to us anyway. Now, so far what we've been seeing in Ephesians 1 is very different than the typical thing that people talk about when they talk about how God blessed them. Have you noticed that? When people say they're blessed, you might hear certain things like, God blessed me with a new car blessed, right? Uh, God blessed me with an unexpected raise. I feel blessed. God's blessed me with a healthy body. I'm blessed. God's blessed me with obedient, overachieving, and above average children. I'm blessed, blessed, blessed. So these are some of the things that people um, talk about when they talk about God blessing them. But there's a question that was raised on the Desiring God blog um, that I read this week. This is from April 28, 2016, and it asked the question, what does it really mean to be hashtag blessed? What does it really mean? Now, the author, Vanitha Rendell Reisner, it's just fun to say, so I have to say that. Anyway, the author, Vanitha, brings home the question of God's blessing by asking us some pointed questions. I wanted to share a few of those with us. For believers, is the blessed life synonymous with the successful life? Think about that. Is the blessed life synonymous with the successful life? Is it the Christian version of the good life? A a loving marriage, obedient children, a vibrant ministry, a healthy body, a successful career, trusted friends, financial abundance. Now, if these are the characteristics of a blessed life, then having all of them should translate into an extraordinarily blessed life. But does it? If someone had all those things, would they be extraordinarily blessed? Now she goes on to say and to point out that with all of those blessings, a person may actually feel self-sufficient and proud. Rather than being grateful to God, they, in fact, may be turned away from the greatest blessing, which is God himself. They could become satisfied with what they have in hand rather than in the God who has provided it for them. Jesus talked about blessings in his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. But the blessings that Jesus talked about typically don't make it to a hashtag on social media. Let me read a few of these. Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I I haven't seen that hashtag blessed on Facebook lately. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's not typically somebody doesn't say I'm blessed because I'm mourning. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Doesn't Jesus understand what blessing from God is? I mean, I think he's missing the point here, don't you think? Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you because of my account. Hashtag blessed. Now, it's not often that we feel blessed with these things, but Jesus says that we are blessed. Do you get that? He doesn't say that we'll be blessed. He says we are blessed with those things. We're blessed because of what they produce in us. And one of the greatest blessings is that it helps to clarify for us what are the greatest things 
the things that God has for us. For example, when we are blessed with the understanding of our poverty of spirit, then we begin to seek the Lord who alone can make a dead spirit come to life. But if you think that you have everything, then you won't reach out to God who has something that only he can give to you. So you can clearly see that Jesus' definition of blessed is very different than the world's definition of blessed. But that doesn't mean that we don't receive blessings from God that may make the hashtag blessed list. Not at all. And so let me point out a few of the general things that God blesses us with. Uh, Number one, marriage and family. We're praying for our marriages this month. A couple of scriptures, um, uh, Proverbs 18, 22, for the single men, he who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. I quoted that before Michelle and I got married. That's my, that was my verse. Receiving a wife is a good and a blessed thing. It says the married man. None of these single men are going to jump out there and say amen. Yeah, no? All right, yeah, I see a thumbs up. Um, children, right? Family, Psalm 127. Children are a heritage from the Lord. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. A good marriage in a family is a tremendous blessing, not just to the husband and wife, but also to their children, also to the society around them. Even so, this blessing takes a lot of work. Amen from the married people, right? Otherwise, a marriage can become a curse. It can be the worst situation in life. The blessing of God's gift of a spouse only remains a blessing as the husband and wife together follow the path of death death to self-centeredness and follow the path of selflessness. And that's God's uh, plan for marriage. Uh, Another hashtag blessing is God's provision. And Jesus said in Matthew 5, God makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now when you take a look at that verse, the sun is not a metaphor for everything good and the rain, a rain metaphor everything bad. Jesus was talking to an agricultural society that knew that you needed both sun and rain in order for there to be plenty, right? And so he's talking about God's blessing here that provided for food to have plenty for people. That blessing took work. It took work to work the fields so that those seeds that were planted could come and be harvested and translate into plenty for the people. And so here's another blessing from God, the sun and the rain, but it took work in order for that blessing to be a blessing. You see a theme here? Another hashtag blessed, speaking of work, is work. Ecclesiastes 3, Solomon says that everyone should drink and eat and take pleasure in his toil, for this is God's gift to man. How many of you this week, on Monday morning, well, you weren't, maybe you didn't work on Monday because there was a snowstorm I hear, right? But sometime this week, my kid went to school on Friday. Monday through Thursday, they were off. How many of you were excited about your kids being home for four days? I didn't, no, you don't have a kid. You can't raise your hand. <laughs> now, so, so they, went to, they went to work to school for one day. But how many of you, in the beginning of the week, you said, I am so blessed because I get to go to work. Hallelujah. How many of you woke up and you're like, hallelujah, I get to work. I bet you not many people did that, right? Did you know that that's wrong? You're supposed to say, I'm blessed because I have work. That's what the Bible says. If you don't want me to preach the Bible, then you might want to find somebody else. But I'm going to preach the Bible here, right? So we need to understand what the Bible says about blessing. And God says that it's a blessing to work. Now, they don't always feel like a blessing, right? But they are God's blessing. And and so all of us, we want blessings from God. But even in the best of times, we can be confused about what those blessings are are. Well, we have plenty, 
we can complain about what we don't have. We can complain because God hasn't blessed us with the job that we want or the toy that we want or the time off that we want or the friends that we want. We must learn to see that God blesses us in lots of different ways. And so uh, this morning, as we take a look and turn our attention to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 14, I want us to recognize that we all have a tendency to downplay and to devalue God's greatest blessings. And so what I want us to do is to open our hearts up to the Lord to see just how greatly God has blessed us and to begin to have a shift in our minds so that we have a biblical perspective on blessing. And so we're going to delve into this, but for this I want to pray for us to that end. So let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to have a biblical perspective on what it means to be blessed. Open our eyes and open our hearts so that we have a hunger for those things that are the greatest blessings. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 14, let me read this. In him, that's in Christ, we have, an obta- we have t- obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all, thing according, all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. So let me focus on the blessings that God has given us. We are blessed, first of all, with an inheritance. We are blessed with an inheritance. Let me tell you an unusual story about an inheritance. A pair of penniless down and outs received a share of a $5.2 billion fortune after a bizarre twist in family fortunes. Brothers Zolt and Giza Pilati were so poor they lived in a cave outside of Budapest, Hungary. They sold scrap for pennies in order to survive. Now both of them and a sister who lives in America inherited their grandmother's massive fortune after a life of poverty. We knew our mother came from a wealthy family, but she was a difficult person and had severed ties with them, then later abandoned us, and we lost touch with her and our father until she eventually died This was what Giza said. Now he's 43 years old. They learned of their good fortune after homelessness charity workers in Hungary were contacted by lawyers handling the estate of the brother's maternal grandmother, who recently died, in Germany. Under German law, direct descendants are automatically entitled to a share of any estate, and that would pass from their dead mother to them. And so... Zolt and Giza went from homeless to billionaires in a single day. Imagine that, right? Under law, because they were part of the family, they were automatically entitled to their inheritance. Now, this is the same thing that's true for us being a part of God's family. Because we've been adopted into the family of Christ by faith in Him, We are automatically assured by God's command, in other words, by God's law, this is God's law, we are automatically assured of our inheritance. In one moment, those of us who had nothing have been given everything. An inheritance that's worth far more than $5.2 billion. Before we were adopted into God's family, God's will had already been predetermined. Now, Paul uses the word predestined, and a few weeks ago, we looked at this word predestined, and it means God's will that's predetermined. He'd already worked it out, worked out all the details. God had already written down his will for his family. His intentions were clear. His purpose is written in black and white for all to see. There's no mistake about it. And so Paul writes these words, that those who have believed in Jesus are predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Paul said it's already in black and white. Now here's where it takes a turn, okay? 
Here's where it takes a twist. We've heard about this before. We've heard about this predestined for our inheritance, which is our relationship with God. Predestined for our inheritance to be with God forever in heaven. We've got that. But then it takes a twist. It's very important, as in any will, to read the tiny little clauses, and you can't overlook this little clause because Paul goes on to say that our inheritance is so that we might be to the praise of his glory. Did you catch that? That we who have hoped in Christ, we who have trusted, we who believed in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. This is part of our inheritance. Our inheritance is not just in the by and by when we're with God in heaven, but there is a very important clause here that those of us who have trusted in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. There's so much more to our inheritance in the Lord than simply receiving. It's also about becoming. It's about being transformed by God so that his glory will shine through us. Did you know that your inheritance was so that God's glory would shine through you to the people around? Did you know that was part of your inheritance? That's what Paul says. And this is the reason why Jesus' definition of blessed is radically different than what our world thinks of as blessing. You see, the world thinks of blessing only in terms of what we get. Isn't that right? That's the only thing that the world thinks of in terms of blessing. But Jesus' definition of blessing is so that we can give what we've been blessed to others. Radically different. In His wisdom, the Lord knows the ultimate greatest blessing we could ever receive is to know His glory, to live for His glory, and to be in every way for God's glory. And this is the reason why God wants to change and mess up your life. Can I have an amen? Amen. He wants to mess up your life for the good. He loves you just the way you are. And he'll take you just the way you are. You don't have to change a single thing about you. But when you get to know Jesus, I guarantee you that he wants to mess up your life. And here's the problem you think your life is probably pretty good right now. But you don't see with the eyes of God what He sees. And He sees a much better future for you than you could possibly even imagine. He has an inheritance to give you that you don't know anything about because you can't see with His perspective. But see, He's already written it down. He's already predetermined. He's already working in you stuff that you don't even know about. There's going to be a blessing to you and it's going to be a blessing to the people in your life. And he's unapologetic about that. I mean, if Jesus can say, blessed are you when you're persecuted, I mean, that's about to rip your head off your shoulders. People said, people lied about me. Thank you, God. I feel blessed. That's what it says. Did you not read the Bible? How many of you have been lied about, people talked about behind your back, said all kinds of nasty things about you, done things to you uh, professionally in your work because you're a believer in Christ? And you thought that you were, you know, the, 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 the worst thing was happening to you. And Jesus says, that's great. Bring it on. You're blessed. You guys, you're not believing me. Jesus, that's what he said. But you don't believe me yet. I know you don't believe me because I can see your faces. I can see your face. You don't believe me. You know what? We have a hard time believing this, don't we? But I, what I want us to do is I want to take us a step further today than we've been before. And I want us to start saying, yes, I am blessed. Can you say that with me? Yes, I am blessed. When somebody says something about you that's a lie, Instead of your response being, woe is me, you can start to say, yes, I am blessed. Because that's what Jesus said. You see, God has a plan for us that is far greater and is far more worthy than the things that we have in mind for ourselves. And this is where many believers in Jesus miss it. You see, many believers in Jesus are still so wrapped up in the way that the world thinks it's because they haven't been truly discipled. They haven't been taught to obey and understand all that Jesus has commanded them. 
and therefore their thoughts about God's blessing still remain on the stuff of this life, the toys, the houses, the jobs, the opportunities. Now again, the Lord does bless us with these things, but they're not the greatest blessings that God has for us. In addition, people, Christians, who haven't been discipled can easily, easily um, misunderstand that stuff gets in the way of the greatest blessings that God has for us. Now, I came across a quote um, by Rachel Gibson this week, which really summarizes this idea perfectly. And this is what she says. Earthly possessions don't just enter our lives quietly. They take up space. They demand upkeep. They demand protection. And they tether our hearts. It's crucial that we rethink our attitude towards our possessions The things that we say God has blessed us with, hashtag blessed, we talk about things that we have received from God as being blessings, but Jesus told us to be careful. He said, be on your guard against all kinds of greed because life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Instead of having an attitude that our possessions or the time that we have is our own, we need to realize that all of it is merely on loan to us from God. The stuff that God gives us does not bring us the greatest blessing if we hoard it to ourselves, but only if we use it or allow it to bring glory to God. Do you recognize that? The stuff that you have is going to be a stumbling block for you unless you give it over to God for His glory and for His honor in your life. It will tear your heart away from God. Now, Jesus really highlights this when He said this. It's more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. If you want to really be blessed, you want to be blessed. Church, do you want to be blessed by God? You really want to be blessed? Give yourself, give your time, and give your stuff away. It's not just a good idea, it's a spiritual law. Those are the words of Jesus. Now, it may be that the Lord convicts you to downsize the number of possessions that you have in your life. If he leads you to do that, go for it. God bless you. But we will always have possessions in one form or another. And so the important thing to do is to first remember that all that we have is merely on loan to us from the Lord, whether that's stuff or whether that's the time that we have in life or whether it's the people that we have in our life. All of those things are merely on loan to us from God. To follow Jesus is to learn how to glorify Him with all of the things that we have, with the time that we be given, with the people that He brings into our lives. Ask the Lord how you can bless somebody somebody else with what you've been given. Maybe that means to give it away, but not all the time. Maybe the blessing that you have for somebody else is to allow them to use what you've been given. Now, I love uh, our partnership with the Boy Scouts because that's their heart. Do you know that the Boy Scouts say, hey, we've got a van, use it if you want. Anybody know that? They have blessed us over and over again with that. You guys have been a blessing to us. Well, you know what? We've been a blessing to them too because we got this thing called Camp Wakanda where they traipse around and do stuff, right? Don't you love it when we get to bless and be blessed? This is the kingdom of God, guys. This is how God planned it. And this is why I love partnerships like this because there is a mutual blessing because God is honored when we use what we've been given to bless somebody else. So we've been given this inheritance and there's times when it doesn't feel like it's it's real because it seems like our inheritance is far off in heaven, okay? Heaven feels like a long ways off most of the time. And so we can easily get pulled away from our greatest blessing of living for God's glory when on a daily basis we live only for ourselves. And so the Lord has given us the blessing of His Holy Spirit to live in us as an encouragement while we wait for the inheritance that we have in Him to be fully realized. And that's what Paul goes on to say, that the Holy Spirit is a deposit in our hearts. It's a guarantee of what's to come. Now, I want, to, I want you to know Paul is absolutely clear when he tells us 
that the Holy Spirit dwells in every person who believes in Christ, who has trusted their life with Christ. We talked about that in our Holy Spirit series in the fall. Everyone who's heard the word of truth, the gospel of their salvation, and has believed has been given the Holy Spirit. Paul goes on to say that those who believe have also been sealed by the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean, to be sealed? A seal is a proof of ownership, and only the owner has the right to open up what has been sealed. When that seal is opened, it will mean that we have acquired full possession of our inheritance in the Lord. That will happen when we stand and we see Jesus Christ face to face. Until that time, the presence of the Spirit in our hearts, in our lives, is our guarantee of that happening. And you know what? There are days when we need that guarantee more than others. We, as those who trust Christ, live in the in-between time of the now and the not yet. We've been called by God to live for the praise of His glory, but on any given day, it feels like we're not living for God's glory. I don't know about you, but it seems to me like there are a lot of days where it feels like I'm just a pretty much the worst Christian on planet Earth. Can anybody relate to my thoughts, right? Any given day, it feels like, and you know what, you can be riding high in the Lord and feel like you're walking with Him, and then the next moment, you feel like you are the absolute worst slob of a Christian that has ever existed, right? Isn't this the way we go? In those moments, it's important for us to remember that God's Holy Spirit lives in us, He's not going away, and He is our guarantee that this day, that's the worst day, is not going to be the last day. That there is a better day that is coming because the Holy Spirit is our seal that God is with us and He is going to make sure that we make it to that day when we see Jesus face to face. And so maybe you've had one of the worst days of your life this week. Maybe you have, uh, um, as a Christian, you felt like you've blown it this week. I want to encourage you this morning that if you've trusted in Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you, and God, the Holy Spirit who lives in you, is going to make sure that you get over the finish line. That this worst day is not your last day. There's a better day that's coming, and it's going to be that day when you look at Jesus face to face. And guess what? He already predetermined it in your life, and he's waiting for that time when he gets to see you and holds your head in his hand. He says, my child, I love you. I've been waiting for you. Welcome home. Amen. Amen. That's right. And the Holy Spirit that lives inside you, believer, is your proof, is your seal that Jesus is waiting for you and he's going to bring you home. Now, I don't know about you, but there are days when I need that news. Maybe you are the one that needed that news this week. Jesus has written it. He always brings his promises to fulfillment. I want to remind you of that. On the days when you don't think that you're going to make it, I want you to look back to this word here in Ephesians chapter 1. You were sealed. You can read it. I'm sealed by the promised Holy Spirit. He is my guarantee of the inheritance until I take possession of it when I see Jesus face to face. And so the Holy Spirit inside us should be a source of our great hope It should give us great confidence before God and before other people. Instead of living uh, in fear of what God might do to us or what other people might say to us or do to us, we live in faith. We live in faith of a glorious future, a hope that cannot be shaken. Our greatest blessing is to fulfill our purpose, which is to bring glory to God. This blessing begins the moment we believe the gospel And it will come to completion when we stand before God in all of his glory. Our glorious hope. Now I want to say something um, that, uh, you know, this weekend is the Super Bowl. I'm not going to guarantee you who's going to win. But I will guarantee you this. God has promised it. If you trusted in Christ, I guarantee you he is going to bring you home to be with him forever. That's a guarantee that you can't find in this world. You can find odds, right? You can take some odds. 
uh, of the Super Bowl. You might win or you might, might lose. You can take other odds. This is 100%. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't trusted your life to Christ, if you haven't said, I'm giving you my life, Jesus. I'm trusting you completely now and forever. I want to give you an opportunity to be able to do that this morning. If God is knocking on your heart and you haven't taken that step, this morning I want to encourage you to give up. Give up and trust in Jesus. Now's your time. So I'm going to pray for you this morning. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you that you've given us precious promises in Jesus Christ. It's by faith alone that we can enter into this inheritance that we have. And Father, for those in, in, in this room this morning whom you are moving in, Lord, who are maybe teetering on this of trusting you, Father, I pray that you would bring them home this morning, that you would give them a hope that can't be shaken, God, that you, Father, that you would cause them to say, Jesus, I trust in you. I'm giving my life and my future to you. And Lord, I pray that you'd fill them now with your Holy Spirit. Fill them now with your Holy Spirit, God. That you would be praised, God. Lord, I just want to say, forgive us for the times when we blow it and we don't give you praise. Lord, we know you do. But help us, God, to remember that you are working in us to transform us so that we, in, in all of our, the areas of our life, we would be for your praise and for your glory. Help us not to be discouraged, Lord, when we blow it, but remind us, God, that you have us and that you will bring us home. For this, Lord, I'm so grateful. Because I don't know about anybody else, but Lord, I need that from you. I need that reminder and I need that encouragement. So thank you for it from your word this morning. Be glorified in your church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.